Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Everyone, and thank you for joining us this week on Market Journal. I'm Bryce Duskett. April is nearly over. For most of us, we're still searching for those April showers as we prepare for the month of May. We know this is certainly a busy time of year for our viewers, so we appreciate you making time for this show. Kicking things off today, many producers have been busy getting their crops planted. For those around central Nebraska, the EPA has lifted a ban on Enlist and Enlist Duo. That will be a benefit to row crop producers. Back in January of this year, the EPA announced a ban on Enlist products, including Enlist One and Enlist Duo. This ban was enacted as a means to ensure the safety of American beetle, which is classified as an endangered species. The presence of this particular insect was the driving force behind the ban that impacted 32 Nebraska counties. However, after a thorough reevaluation, Enlist One and Enlist Duo are back in play for producers in the counties that were impacted by this ban. But then again on March 29th, US EPA revisited um, their risk assessment analysis and also some in more information they received from US Fish and Wildlife Service. They conducted um, risk assessment analysis again and then they came up with the information that uh, now um, even in those 32 counties, um, the risk of uh, uh, American budding beetle will not be affected uh, by the use of Enlist One or Enlist Duo. So therefore now the take home message for growers is it is okay to use Enlist One or Enlist Duo in those counties. So basically in Nebraska now there is no any restriction on use of uh, those two herbicides in any of the county. This development will come as a bit of relief for those who are working with Enlist Seed. Those products help those producers rein in and get control over several broadleaf weeds as well as others that have developed glyphosate resistance. It helps because we have at least six broadleaf weeds have evolved resistant to herbicides, particularly glyphosate. So for controlling those glyphosate resistant broadleaf weeds, the use of Enlist One and Enlist Duo in endless corn and soybean can help to control those uh, glyphosate resistant as well as susceptible broadleaf weed species. So now number one, they can use those two products. However, you need to make sure you just follow all the label requirements when you apply those herbicides uh, because there are a number of uh, requirements including proper use of adjuvants, proper use of nozzles and wind speed and everything is still in place. So there is no change on any of those requirements. Um, so yeah, just basically you need to follow the label and uh, uh, apply those. If you'd like to learn more about this decision by the EPA, we provided a link to an informative CropWatch article to the Market Journal website. That story gives producers insight into this decision as well as updated label information for Enlist products. Moving over to the grain markets now, we're joined this week by Darren Newsom of Darren Newsom Analysis. This week we saw a rally in both the U.S. dollar and in the grain markets. Darren, you point out that's not really something that's supposed to happen. What gives? Yeah, it, it's always interesting, Bryce, and I appreciate you having me on again. Uh, you know, the old story is, you know, if, if the dollar's going up, grain should not. And what we've got going on now is different than most rallies that we see like this. Is that we're just short supply of everything. And so it doesn't really matter if the dollar is going higher because part of the reason why the dollar is going higher is because of inflation and the, the moves that the U.S. Federal Reserve is going to make. And it, it's part of the inflation is due to the fact that we just don't have many, you know, we don't have much corn, soybeans or wheat on the books right now or, or in the bins right now. Everyone's waiting on these next harvests. So we've got the scenario where tight supplies, strong demand. And the Fed's going to make some moves to try to control inflation by, by pushing interest rates higher, and that strengthens the dollar. So everything's going up at the same time at this point. So you said we've definitely got a lot of question, mark, question marks out there, but which one is most fascinating? Which one's most important to pay attention this time of year? Is, does it have to do with the planting progress? 
No, not 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 whatsoever. Those those numbers are completely fictitious. Uh, we have to watch the weather. I mean, above all else, these markets are weather derivatives. And so, I mean, if people want to tie that to things like planning progress and conditions, fine. Uh, they, they can play that game. But the reality is we can see where there's problems. And there, there's planting that's being done right now, but it's being done in terrible conditions. It's, it's incredibly dry. Uh, so folks across the central, uh, central plains and southern plains are really counting on this week's rains. And that's going to change uh, you know, what, what our expectations are for these markets down the road. The biggest thing is, regardless of what the acres are, regardless of what yield turns out to be, and all of these other guesses that like to be made about the markets, the commercial side is telling us there's not going to be enough. I mean, we can look at the future spreads, corn, soybeans, wheat, across the board. There's not going to be enough production in 2022 to change these supply and demand situations, regardless of what all these unknown variables are. And that's the key. And it all comes back to weather. And it's just how tight is it going to be depends on, you know, what the weather develop, how, how the weather develops. So, Darren, if there's not enough product for any of those markets you just mentioned, what is the ceiling for these grain markets, in your opinion? I have no idea. Um, you know, as long as the fundamentals stay bullish, these markets can go higher. They're going to continue to find non-commercial. I mean, they're going to continue to find non-commercial investment, fund money, whatever you want to call it. I, I was asked today, is $8 corn a good buy? Yeah. I mean, if, if, if they're fundamentally bullish, why not? It's just a number. And we'll know if bubbles are starting to form in this market, if it's becoming a bubble market based on what happens with basis. If basis all of a sudden starts to collapse, it means the commercial side is no longer supporting this, uh, these markets. And that's when bubbles form. Right now, that's simply not the case. Darren, let's talk about distillates. We're not talking about bourbon when we talk about that, though. You say there's strength in the markets. Bring us up to speed. Oh, the distillates market. And again, it's 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 fun to always talk about bourbon. But in this case, we're talking about diesel fuel, jet fuel, heating oil, all these things. It's just been on an incredible run lately. I think on uh, on Tuesday, I believe it gained as much as something like 48 cents, uh, the spot the spot month futures contract. And it followed up with another big rally, 15, 20 cents on Wednesday. Just, you know, huge moves. We're getting into that time of year. No, it's not heating season for heating oil. But, you know, there's, there's going to be more field work, at least theoretically, it's going to be done. We've got strong demand globally for diesel fuel. Uh, and so, you know, th this market's just taking off and, and flying right now. And, and it's out distance. It's clearly out distancing crude oil at this point. Uh, it's actually leading the charge in the uh, in the energy complex and certainly something we're going to have to continue to watch. Darren, every time we have you, every time we have you on Market Journal, we always get some interesting viewer questions. So we want to make sure we get a few of them included in the broadcast. One of them has to do with selling or locking in prices for the 2023 crop. What's your take on what producers should be doing right now? It's what I always say. If my dad were sitting across the table from me and asked, "Hey, is this a good time to to, to make some sales?" I'd say yes. I'm not going to talk you out of selling at a profit, but I don't want to sell very much. I think these markets still have some room. I think they still have some room to move higher. Uh, again, fundamentally, everything is bullish right now for 2022. And in this situation, extends out to 2023 and even in soybeans out through 2024, 25 marketing year. So we've got plenty of time. But by all means, if we want to lock some of this in, even if it's just to pay some of the input costs, the fuel we were just talking about, uh, fertilizer prices that continue to go up, then, you know, you do that. Make make a few sales here and there. Keep plenty of powder dry because we have no idea what the weather is going to deal us this summer then next winter and on into next spring as well. You mentioned the price of fertilizer. Another viewer asked uh, if we could ask you about that. Are you, what are you seeing when it comes to the fertilizer prices right now? You know, I, I don't know what the prices are at this point. I do know they're not coming down anytime soon. They're going to stay high this year, probably through the winter and into next year. I, I just, the situation in Ukraine with, with Russia's war against Ukraine, the overall you know, tightness of the, of the fertilizer supply situation is not going to allow prices to come down. We've got strong demand here in the U.S., particularly if we're going to get a poor seeding uh, on the corn crop. We'll farm and, and, and prices where they are. Will producers be willing to fork out a little bit more to kind of chase and push the, the supplies that are available out there, uh, increasing the prices even more? So I think it's going to be a very tight situation as far as getting fertilizer locked in. And those that and those that can find the fertilizer price is going to be pretty high that is all the time we had for this week's grain market analysis for our regular broadcast we do have a, an extended conversation with darren that we've uploaded to our youtube channel 
Shifting our attention over to the livestock sector now, we were joined this week by UNL livestock economist Elliot Dennis to get his take on a multitude of topics ranging from highly pathogenic avian influenza to the latest happenings in the cattle markets. We began by getting his thoughts on the spread of HPAI. Well, let's start today's conversation with highly pathogenic avian influenza, kind of where we've began our last few discussions, Elliot. Where do we sit right now in terms of the number of birds and perhaps the number of states as well that have infections? Yeah, so right now we're about 30 million total. And, and of that uh, layers or chickens that produce table eggs are, are the largest portion of that. Uh, second, but really significantly lower is about is our turkeys. They're about four million head, and most of that is really confined in the in the South Dakota, Minnesota area. Ironically, this is the where the area where we saw it really prevalent last time. Uh, we had avian influenza in 2015. A lot of discussion about why that area tends to be a hot spot, um, but really the biggest issue that everyone was talking up. I know I was talking about it a lot leading up to. Uh, the Easter season was the egg prices, and USDA releases their weekly egg report, and we did see higher egg prices as pre high path avian influenza, but particularly with the increase kind of later Easter season. Um, but since then, prices have kind of come back, um, you know, down from those highs. And this is not different than what we've seen in, uh, in 2015, but uh, just given where we were at in the season, um, we experienced those feed prices being the, the largest driver. You referenced uh, feed prices, or not, excuse me, not feed prices, you referenced 2015 a couple of times here mm -hmm. in your opening yeah. statement about HPAI. History often repeats itself, and if we go with that mindset, what has struck you as similar to 2015 and still at the same time maybe a little bit different? Yeah, in the beginning we were, even myself was kind of wondering if we had learned from 2015 to really kind of either biosecurity or we were able to contain it a lot quicker. It seems not to be the case, actually. If we look at kind of the epidemic curves, uh, those have pretty much followed the same path, except only things we've shifted a couple weeks later, but that's just because we started. And so that's something that I found to be really interesting. Uh, similar market reactions relative to uh, the pr egg prices in particular. If we take lessons from that, we're looking at maybe production, lower production in egg laying for the next nine months uh, and relatively uh, lower broiler export markets. We still benefit from regionality and, and being able to trade with our export partners, but um, we're still likely to see an effect there as well. Based on what you've seen and uh, the numbers you've tracked, do you think egg prices still go up a little bit higher than what we're currently seeing? I think we're probably on the down end of the egg prices and more stabilizing but at higher prices pre-age uh, path. Uh, I think we're still going to be higher going into the summer and into the fall, but, uh, but I think we're going to see higher than normal, but not as high as we're seeing around that, the Easter season. Well, let's, show, let's uh, shift up the conversation a little bit here, Elliot, and talk about uh, the cattle market. We like to do that when you come yeah. on to Market Journal. We had a cattle on feed report recently. What numbers in particular stuck out to you from that? Yeah, so we always talk about pre-market expectations and we talk about it in what the market actually traded at. This gives us an idea of how much the really the CME adjusts. Uh, the Probably the biggest expectation on that was that we thought we were so full in the feedlots and we thought, is there a possible way that we're going to place more cattle? And somehow cattle producers, particularly here in Nebraska, found ways to source cattle and put them here. Uh, we were actually up about you know, six to seven percent of market expectations. Really what that ended up doing is we ended up having quite a bit of sell-off in, in the CME live cattle futures. Um, that's probably the biggest ex or biggest shock to the market. And really when we look at that steered heifer mix every quarter, we get the quarterly report and we still see quite a bit of um, heifers on feed, which really gives us an indication that we are not holding back heifers uh, for herd rebuilding right now. So based on the numbers you saw in the cattle on feed report and the other factors in the cattle market right now, what's it telling you about the trends we're seeing? Yeah, I think there's some pre-pricing of droughts. I think people are still kind of sorting through what they believe droughts will be. Some of that's probably helped out by extremely high coal cow prices. We haven't seen these level of coal cow prices in five to eight years. I think produce, some producers are taking advantage of that, further liquidating the herds. People are also trying to manage a little bit about pre-drought expectations. 
uh, given high feed costs. And I think something that's uh, really has really shocked me is that we're able to find space for cattle. I think that's a, a positive thing going into the summer, but if we start to really have a severe drought and uh, cow-calf producers need to place earlier, uh, I don't think there's just going to be space for them. Give you the final word here and wrap up. Uh, final thoughts from you on this cattle market industry or risk management advice you'd like to offer? Yeah, I think anytime we come on here, we always talk about risk management. We always talk about market expectations. I have my own thoughts about where the markets, if you look at ag media in general, they have their markets, but generally those are based upon current information. No one really knows what's going to happen in a year, two years, or even it'd be really great if you didn't even know what six months would be a right price. And so just risk management always tends to be um, there for an opportunity for producers to manage that risk. And so working with a, an advisor or trying to do that yourself is always warranted, especially when we have disease instances like they're experiencing the poultry. We can't expect so, so it's best to be prepared. Thanks again to both of our market analysts this week. Next week, we'll be joined by Jeff Peterson. He is the president of Heartland Farm Partners. If you have a question for me to ask Jeff, be sure to get in touch with us on social media. Nebraska is the home of Arbor Day with Nebraska City Statesman, publisher and agriculture promoter Jay Sterling Morton proposing the very first Arbor Day back in 1872. The love affair Nebraskans have with their trees, woodlands and forests is probably the reason why from 1895 to 1945, the state was known officially not for the Cornhuskers, but for the tree planter state. As we celebrate Arbor Day this year, it is a good idea to look back on the generations of tree planting heroes our state has produced and to look forward to the hundreds of farmers and ranchers that continue to plant conservation trees on their land each year. You can learn more about Arbor Day and Nebraska's tree planting roots in the latest issue of the Nebraska Farmer. Well, it is now time for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Well, Al, the past week made for some good planting conditions for some folks, but I know others would sure like to see some moisture. How are things looking as we turn to the week ahead? Well, Bryce, we certainly did see some of the warmer temperatures move in during the middle part of the week. And of course, we've been persistently dry for most of the month of April. But we have had this storm system that came in over this last 24 hours. that's brought some relief to portions of the state. And of course, that's continuing on today. Hopefully that will help to reduce some of the fire danger, at least temporarily, but we're going to need several of these systems of the magnitude that we're seeing over this last 24 to 48 hours in order for us to have any semblance of a chance to escape significant drought problems this summer. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see what we might have in store as we go through this next seven day period. And the first thing I'll draw your attention to is a system responsible for the precipitation that's ongoing across the state today. The upper air low itself is centered over uh, central Iowa and will gradually start to move toward the Great Lakes. So the surface low is over northeastern Nebraska and that's a what we call a tilted storm system. So there's a lot of energy with it. And we're seeing that wrap around moisture, the heaviest precipitation expected across the northern half of the state, lighter amounts as you go toward the south. That system, by the time we get to tomorrow, or we'll move off into the Great Lakes region with low pressure over portions of western Wisconsin. And then we see another piece of energy over New Mexico that will drive energy across the southern plains. We'll see the precipitation wrap up early uh, tomorrow morning and then we turn our attention to the west where another low pressure system is developed in the upper atmosphere. Surface low over Wyoming basically is going to start to make its way toward the central and northern plains. But most of the energy that we see in the cutoff of moisture will be because of that low pressure system moving out of the southwestern United States. Now that system gets a little bit stronger as it moves into the high plains regions as we go into Tuesday. We got a double barrel low pressure system potentially setting up. So that should give us a good fetch of moisture. And that moisture will start to really congeal over the northern plains. And then that system will dive toward the southeast as we go into Wednesday. And that will bring that precipitation band across the least eastern half of Nebraska as high pressure starts to build in behind it. And in, in regards to that, the precipitation shield itself will start to slide across the Missouri River Valley and then move over into the Ohio River Valley. We kind of get this elongated trough, which means it's going to weaken somewhat. There's not going to be a lot of energy with it with that high pressure building into our region. We'll see some cooler temperatures on Thursday before we start to see a warming trend going into the weekend. And the main precipitation with this system 
that goes through us midweek will be well over into the Ohio River Valley. On Friday, we start to see ridging and aloft, warmer temperatures start to build in, and we have an upper air low that start to move into the desert southwest with low pressure stacked up over California. That will bring some precipitation to the Sierras and to the Cascades on the west coast. And eventually this will start to make its way into the central plains. The question is, what will it do? And there's a lot of uncertainty in regards to the model. So if we look at the 8 to 14 day forecast, it takes us out from next Tuesday to the following, next Thursday to the following Tuesday. We see that Nebraska is once again caught between the below normal temperatures to the north and the above normal temperatures to the south. That means that generally when you get these conflicting air masses that something is going to take shape in the middle of the country and in terms of precipitation is exactly what the precipitation is featuring. A zone of pretty significant chances of above normal moisture all the way from the west coast through the central plains and into the Ohio River Valley. And then after that we will start to look to see whether or not Additional systems are coming on board. There are hints from the models at least to the first full week of May will be active. And then we'll get a drying trend for a few days before another powerful system starts to come into the western United States. So at least we're starting to get a little bit of moisture. We're going to need a lot more of this in order to break this drought, but at least the trend for the short term is a little bit more positive. Thank you, Al. For a majority of Nebraska, precipitation was below normal levels between the fall of 2021 through the spring of 2022. This left fields in good condition for pre-planting pre nitrogen applications. However, there are still some justifiable reasons to consider shifting more nitrogen application to in-season as opposed to pre-planting. Market Journal's Bill Dodd recently sat down with a Nebraska Extension Nutrient Management and Water Quality Specialist to get a better understanding of some of the benefits associated with in-season nitrogen application. It seems drought has been all too common in Nebraska in recent months, and a winter that was practically precipitation free for much of the state has left many fields with a good amount of carryover nitrogen from the previous season. With that in mind, there's good reason to consider in-season or split nitrogen applications this season. And uh, the drier conditions uh, did not uh, result in, in a lot of nitrogen moving in the, in the soil. So any nitrogen that was uh, for, left from the last year in fall or residual nitrate, nitrogen would carry over uh, for the next growing season. And uh, in addition, we also got some warmer temperature during March and April, uh, which increased microbial activity in the soil increase uh, soil organic uh, matter mineralization, increase nitrogen availability in the so into the soil. So with all of that being drier conditions and warmer temperature, more nitrogen is available in the soil. So the farmers need to take that nitrogen in, into account while they are calculating their nitrogen budget for, the, for this growing season. This reactive element can be diminished through several pathways, including leaching and volatization. However, there are some steps you can take to mitigate any potential loss of nitrogen. For example, it can be lost uh, in the form of gaseous emissions or ammonia volatilization when you would apply nitrogen over the soil surface. Um, and then, so that's why we recommend to inject nitrogen fertilizer into the ground or incorporate that nitrogen, which can be done with half inch of uh, rain or, or irrigation event. Uh, and then there are other ways to protect that nitrogen as well. For example, there are some nitrogen stabilizers, including urease inhibitor, which can protect nitrogen for some period of time till it is incorporated into the soil with, with the rainfall event. And in addition to gaseous losses, nitrogen can also be lost through leaching of nitrate uh, to the groundwater, again, which is a groundwater uh, quality issue. Uh, so in order to protect the nitrogen losses, in order to avoid these nitrogen losses, uh, again, we recommend splitting nitrogen uh, as a pre-plan and in-season uh, to reduce those nitrogen losses. When it comes to tracking available nitrogen in your fields, there are a number of soil and crop-based tools that can be particularly useful for any producer when it comes to making nitrogen management decisions. Uh, so I will give here a couple of examples from these tools. Uh, for example, when we talk about soil test, late spring soil nitrate test is one of the useful tool uh, where uh, soil nitrate sampling can uh, be conducted during the late spring when the cone is about one foot tall. So with this tool, uh, you can estimate how much nitrogen is available for the crop needs and how much nitrogen do you need, do you need to side dress. So this nitrogen uh, tool was 
calibrated in fine textured soil in Iowa, and this can be used in fine to medium textured soils in Nebraska. Uh, talking about the crop-based tools, remote uh, sensing is uh, one of the unique tools that has been used in on-farm research and has shown some promising results. Uh, so using this innovative technology of crop canopy sensing, uh, we can determine how much nitrogen does your crop need during the growing season. Uh, this is a kind of reactive approach where your crop can reflect how much nitrogen does your crop need. So again, uh, using any of these in-season nitrogen management tool can better help to meet the crop nitrogen needs and reduce the risk for nitrogen loss while improving uh, nitrogen use efficiency and profits. In cases of in-season nitrogen application, the use of fertigation should not be overlooked. This cost-effective method gives producers the opportunity to adjust nitrogen rates as needed. Uh, when you compare this to a pre-planned nitrogen, pre-planned nitrogen is often based on a predetermined nitrogen rate, while the fertigation gives you, a, gives you an option to adjust the nitrogen rates uh, on, depending on the crop nitrogen status during the growing season. And then again, different in-season nitrogen management tools like remote sensing, aerial imagery, or chlorophyll meter, those can be used to, to, uh, to get an estimate how much nitrogen you need to apply through fertigation. With the dry weather we've been experiencing recently, it would be prudent to have a good idea of how much carryover nitrogen is in your fields as your operation may not have experienced too much nitrogen loss. And keeping an eye on your nitrogen needs throughout the season could really pay off in the long run. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thank you for that story, Bill. If you'd like to learn more about in-season nitrogen application strategies and methods, we've included some helpful links online at the Market Journal website. Well, that is going to do it for this week's show. Remember, if you missed a story, be sure to follow us on the YouTube channel and on social media to join in on the conversation. We hope to see you back here next time. Until then, I'm Bryce Duskett. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.